Hey, good afternoon and welcome to episode three of the Silicon Brighton CCO series. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Will Ogden. Uh, Will is the CTO at Trust and Tower Stitters, uh, a local uh, tech startup success story here in Brighton, where we'll be talking about Will's journey from uh, graduating here in the city to a senior developer to now um, holding the CTO position at Trusted House Sitters um, and the story of, uh, of Trusted House Sitters, uh, particularly throughout Will's time there and how they've gone from a, a local business to now operating in uh, Europe, the US, Canada, Australia, some of the challenges that 2020 has thrown at them and what we can look forward to from uh, Will and the guys uh, next year. Uh, thanks for joining me, Will. Thank you for having me, man. Hey, great to be here. Um, so yeah, how do where do we get started from? So from myself, yeah. my background, um, I was always really into technology as a kid. Uh, started programming when I was about six years old, I think. I think my dad came back with a, a sort of an Amiga five hundred, uh, yeah. and I sort of started playing with that, looking at the games, and thinking, oh, this this, this is quite good. Always sort of envisaged doing something with technology with computers. Um, in secondary school, sort of realised I could program bits to do my homework for me, so I could spend more time on my BMX, and uh, just yeah. <laughs> that was, that was great. So very into programming then, and just again always thought I'd go and do that. Um, went to Sussex Uni, studied computer science and AI. Um, while I was doing that, so I graduated in two thousand and one. So all the way through university, it was the kind of the dot com bubble was building. Uh, everyone was very, very bullish on the tech scene and all the way through university, it was, you're going to get an amazing job. There's going to be golden handshakes galore. You're going to get yeah. <laughs> remuneration through the roof. Um, and then, of course, as I graduated, that just completely disappeared. So 2001, there was sort of a dearth of opportunity. I had I had in university applied to work on the IBM grad scheme. Okay. And in fact, they still offered me a role, but it was sort of being embedded within um, IBM tech. Um, and I kind of wanted to work in the, in the labs. There's a labs down near Portsmouth I was interested in. So I was sort of back to the, the drawing boards of what to do and where to work. And I'm, I just I came across a local startup um, uh, called The Changing Workplace who were yeah. building um, sort of corporate real estate software. So at this time, back in 2001, all this kind of software was stuff that you got on DVD in the post and you had to install it on your PC. And it was very, you know, it was really quite kind of really old fashioned. And what the changing workplace were doing were webifying all that stuff and very, you know, very one of sort of very early SaaS businesses. Um, so join join the team there as the second tech hire. Um, again, really small business, six or so people working out of a barn in the middle of nowhere, um, right. and that just like and that just grew. And over the next few years, the business grew, team grew. Um, we serviced lots of really big sort of blue chip businesses, so American Express, Barclays. Um, Standard Charter Bank, TFL, um, and you know over the over the years we sort of end, ended up with businesses like Microsoft. So selling software, so like you know the, at the time the biggest software business in the world was and it was amazing. So fantastic business, really innovative, coming up with lots of like interesting IoT things, lots of web stuff, really really cool. Um, so I was doing that and really enjoyed it, um, but it was a B two B play and it was. Um, Sort of we we had a product, but we were also working for our clients in like an agency model as well. Um, and I really fancied having a stab at B two C. I like the idea of something a bit with a bit a bit bigger, more users, different sorts of technical challenges. Um, and so yeah, I just I came across Trusted House Sitters, um, uh, met the founders uh, Andy Peck and Rachel Martin. Really liked their energy. I thought the tech at the time there on this you know was was uh, a little bit lackluster then there was an opportunity to improve it um so yeah i i joined ship with them in 2013 so i think the business had been going since 2010 um but it had been quite small so 2013 it was um it was still really really small the sharing economy was getting noticed airbnb was a thing but not really a, like a night lot of people weren't really talking about it that much 
Um, so yeah, just a great opportunity. And at the time, no office working out the back room of their flat, um, a proper, you know, proper, proper startup thing. Um, and from there, it just grew. I mean, and you know, it's a going from a kind of early part of my career in corporate real estate to then trusted house sitters where it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, pet, pets and travel, you know, you talk to anyone yeah. about the business, you know, we get compared to like the sort of the Airbnb for pets, but yeah. it's, you know, it's, you know, it's bigger than that. So it's, it's brilliant. So it's just been able to talk about that and people just be so positive and excited about it every time you sort of mention it and how does it work? And that sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so from there, we did Trusted House. It is started from a you know, very, very small team. And then over the next, so it's, uh, that was 2013. So now, so sort of six and a bit years, um, the business has grown. Yeah, we're in like 190 countries or something crazy. Um, lot, you know, thousands of, you know, tens of thousands of members. Yeah. Um, bigger team. Um, so I think we're about 40 now. Yeah. Um, yeah and just and just fantastic so it's just it's a very 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 different sort of business uh to the you know the one i did in my early career but it's um yeah absolutely fascinating and just amazing to work with a business where you've got such an engaged member base and you know, an yeah. engaged community yeah fantastic so for those of uh um i'm sure there won't be many but for those of the guys who don't know tell us a bit about trusted house this is the product and, and what you guys do just a high level overview if that's okay yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're a sharing economy business and, and we're a marketplace. So we connect these two disparate sides of the network. And so on one hand, we've got um, pets and homeowners who yeah. have got have got a pet, they've got a home and they, they're going away and they typically want pet care. They want to put their, you know, they take their beloved uh, dog or cat. They don't want to put them in kennels or catteries. Um, and so what they do is they exchange their home with a um, with pet care. So a sitter yeah will come will find their sit so very much like if you're looking on airbnb you can look for all these amazing places and pets they will apply and they will get selected by the owner who then um they then come and look after the house so um there is an exchange so no money changes hands so once the sitter comes and looks after the the pet and stays in the home there's no money changing hands there both sides of the network pay to join the platform for 12 months so we're a subscription business and then within that 12 months you can have as many interactions sits and pet care as you want so it's uh yeah it's a it's, it's a it's a fascinating business and i think the fact that money doesn't change hands it's just it really changes the dynamic between the it's much more of a community than a kind of a transactional site yeah absolutely you can tell that already from i mean i've used the, uh, the platform myself as in my family but you can tell from um just looking at the website the engagement of the community there and i think the fact it's solving problems on both sides of the fence whilst um you know uh, providing a, a a service that uh, is intrinsically linked to really emotive things you know pets and travel which people love to do um it was always going to be a success but i guess when you started seven years ago now eight years ago um and they were that sort of tiny, you know, uh, in a house or above an office, wherever you, you, you were based. What was the kind of remit given to you then? Um, you know, you mentioned the slightly legacy tech stack, which was an interesting challenge for you to overcome. Um, but what was the kind of blueprint roadmap? How did it look then um, to, you know, to get to where you are now today? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, in the early days, you do whatever you need to do to try and grow. I mean, the, the, asp the aspiration was always we wanted to grow. We believed we had uh, product market fit. We believed this was the best solution and we wanted to do whatever it took to try and get the name out there. So, you know, and, and you know, the opportunity when, so when I joined the business, um, the opportunity was um, really to try and make it more mobile friendly. So back in 2013, again, we had a lot of, uh, it, was, it was predominantly a desktop site and it kind of wasn't that friendly on mobile. Um, and even, you know, in 2013, we were still actually seeing more desktop traffic than mobile traffic, but you could see from the shape of like graphs that that was gonna change at some point. So, you know, early on, it was very much try and make it more web friendly, uh, mobile friendly, um, try and build that out. Um, just try and make it look a little bit more, uh, a little bit smarter and uh, we kind of, there were other sites around at the time doing trying to do something similar, um, but we wanted to make it more um, commoditized, easier for people to use, build all that verification to make a really safe, secure, trusted community. Um, so it was just investing in that kind of stuff. So we invested a lot of time and effort in building a re like reviews, feedback systems, yeah. lots of um, effort in verifications. Um, document checks all that kind of stuff and trying to automate it because we we figured that it was that trust 
to let someone into your home to look after the things you love the most, you've got to really trust them. So trying to build the tools and apply the technology to help with that stuff was super important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in terms of, I guess, approaching what was there already in terms of the sort of legacy tech, if you like, and um, I mean, did you have an idea of, of, of how big the platform was going to be, you know, the sort of uh, the growth into those 165 odd countries that you mentioned and what kind of considerations did you have to give when sort of thinking about designing a new architecture or, you know, you know designing something to, to scale to that size? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so when I joined, it was just me. So I'd gone from a business before where I had a, lot, a big team to do stuff to a team, to a team of one yeah. with me to do everything. And so, by you know, yeah, hands on. As well. Yeah, absolutely. So and, and so with that comes it helps you with your thinking and making things that are easy to manage and easy to scale. If if everything's too complex, it's simply you can't deal with it. So, you know, and I think. It's things like that that I think have um, kept with me, certainly, as I've, you know, as the company's grown. I mean, very much trying to use off the shelf solutions, open source work where you can leverage other people's uh, smarts. You don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time, especially when it's a small team. And really just to focus on the USP, the thing that we did differently from everyone else. And that's where you spend all your, your dev time. Um, again, things, you know, like, like hosting an infrastructure everything obviously cloud-based don't like you know try and have a, you know, and even down to like one of the benefits actually is we we with the how we had the office set up which has actually helped with the pandemic is we had very little office uh it infrastructure everything cloud-based and almost like a bunch you know a team of remote workers working in the same place which made transition into home working incredibly easy when it came yeah. into it so always you're yeah, always just trying to think about what's easy um how can you manage it on a very small team? And then it just makes scaling a lot simpler. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So I guess focusing your uh, dev time, the creative time on the, 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 the USPs and the things that make you different and how you can improve that sort of customer engagement side of things, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, t techies love to build things and I'm not any yeah. different. Like you do want to just build these things. But again, commercially you've got to think of what's what makes sense as well and you've got it's always going to be that balancing act it's like when you can ap apply new tech stuff when you've just got yeah. to do something simple and easy to maintain they're both you've got to strike the balance to be commercial yeah no no completely agree it makes complete sense in, in terms of the um, engineering team now then from um from one man yourself to where we are today how does how does that look yeah, so we've got, so we have uh, cross-functional squads. So, right. I mean, there's a lot of talk of the Spotify model with these cross-functional teams and stuff. And I I don't think I'm an advocate. You can't just roll out Spotify to every business because not every business is Spotify and it doesn't really work. But yeah. I think cross-functional, I'm a massive believer in cross-functional teams. Um, you know, when, when we started out and we we're a very small team, you know what's going on. You're very highly aligned. You know what you're working on. Um, and as you get bigger, if you don't do that it's easy for people to get siloed and stuff to get sort of misaligned so having these cross-functional teams that are almost working as sort of micro businesses within a bigger business feels absolutely the right thing to do so yeah at trusted house this is where we're that we have um, cross-functional teams and so teams are made up of um, engineers full stack backend generalists um acute you know qas product designers product managers um, and data analysts and they all work as their own kind of really trying to be an autonomous team um, yeah. that are aligned on a, a particular business goal. So we try and have them sort of autonomous. They try and run their own roadmaps, but they're kind of, we align the whole business around some sort of key um, key objectives. And then so we kind of have these teams working. They're working separately, but they're all working towards, uh, you know, like an aligned direction. Yeah, right. And in terms of, so they've got complete ownership of that part of the product, and I guess that, um, the, the autonomy gives them that, that buy-in that they can perhaps. Is that would you say that improves their creativity or some of the yeah in the way they approach tasks? I, or? I think so. I think you give people ownership and they've got skin in the game. If they, you know, if you say you come up with the come up with the plan, you come up with the roadmap, you own what's going to move the dial on this particular metric, then they're much more invested and they're much more engaged with it. So yeah, ab absolutely. So we find we find you know it's work it's working really well. Um, you know, and, and it, like good ideas come from everywhere in the business, and it feels like having um, a kind of much flatter, um, this kind of highly aligned but loosely coupled setup just seems to work really well for us. 
yeah, it's a common theme that that, that I hear actually. The, the kind of the, the flatter structure um, and the higher degree of autonomy, it just it seems to really, really make a big difference to productivity as opposed to not necessarily just enterprise, but some of the larger clients that I work with where people are given, you know, fairly narrow tasks, if you like, to get on with. It, 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 can, it can perhaps dilute some of that enthusiasm or creativity which brought them to the role in the first place. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that's, you know, from like a culture perspective, I think that's absolutely right. I think, it, you know, giving people ownership and allowing them to, you know, help steer the business in the in the right direction. Just I think this, it just gives that people that ownership and it really does help with, with everything. So, yeah, it's yeah. definitely a massive advocate of it. Great. And uh, I guess something that I'm interested in, I know that some of our community would be interested to hear about is how much your role has changed during that time, obviously. Um, you know, we've heard about when you were um, kind of the first technical person on board, if you like. Now, as a CTO, managing um, the squad's uh, engineering managers and, and larger uh, teams. Um, what does your day look like now in comparison to what it looked like, you know, seven years ago? And how has that evolved over that period? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's changed a lot. I mean, I mean, what I would say to... Um, it's, uh, being a CTO is not about coding. I mean, it, I mean, it, I think it, it obviously depends on uh, every business has its own demands, and I think you know exec teams are different, and depending on who's on, you know, who's in the team, you sort of fulfil a slightly different role. But um, I mean, going from the early days where it is much more being um, a generalist and being like, can I fix the office router? Is just was just as important <laughs> as uh, you know looking at decisions on like mo mo mobile tech technology, or whatever. It was you know you have to be able to do everything. Um, so having that kind of in the so in the early days, yeah, being a generalist, being able to just know and you know <laughs> not be rubbish at any one particular thing, know enough just to get by in any particular area was probably sufficient, um, and that's what the that's what the team really needed then. Being able to, um, I think, communicate, I think, is a key element, and I think that goes with any kind of leadership position. It's like you know, I, I think sometimes technology is easy, but people are hard. You do need like the communication stuff is. Is very important to try and get right, and, yeah. and as you as the teams and businesses grow, that's definitely the thing that is the is the thing that changes. I mean, you going from if you're trying to grow a business in the early days, you can be okay at everything. As you get bigger, you want to get people in who can do things you can't. So yeah. I think sort of knowing your blind sides and knowing what you're not so good at, and then trying to get people to help you with that's really important. Yeah. Um, and then as uh, yeah, as as the tech company grows now, it becomes a how do you facilitate others success i mean that's yeah. that's the thing is helping people be aligned it's helping them um solve problems it's helping yeah. them develop and become better at what they do yeah. um and that's the that's how it's different so now my role is um you know it's much more a um, part of the exec team so it's much more co it's commercial it's looking yeah. at how we can apply technology to the problems we're trying to solve our members problems yeah. um Knowing when not to apply technology is probably the biggest thing, the biggest skill. It's very easy to go off and build, spend hours using devs to build stuff, but it's, in, it's knowing when, when and what to build. Um, and so, yeah, a lot more, lot more kind of, a uh, lot more people and process now than necessarily um, in the early days when it was like much more hands-on and coding. I yeah. mean, I, I still enjoy and I still do get involved with the coding i still like i'm still a programmer at heart you know um but i do less of it and i've got people in my team who are better at it than me now so yeah. i'd rather i'd rather i'd rather they did and did a better job if i want to say yeah absolutely and I, I guess um a couple of interesting points there um i think the you alluded to sort of in turning more into a facilitator or helping to others to become better and far more of a um i guess a yeah a facilitator in that respect now from um if we go back in the day when you were um, a, a developer, perhaps those um, skills or characteristics might not come naturally to everyone. Is that something that you personally have had to work on? Have they come naturally to you? Or how have you, um, I guess, become a, a more well-rounded leader in that regard? Because for, for some, I guess, developers that are thinking, I want to do that, but perhaps I, I, could, I could be better at it. How did you approach that? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think I was born with, I don't think I was definitely born with the leadership skills. It's something you definitely learn over time and you get better at. And I, you know, I remember early days leading a team and we did 360 reviews. And I think one year I did it and they said, and I got feedback saying, 
Will's too, uh, he's too, he's too controlling and tells us to, tells us to do everything too much. And I thought, okay, well, I hear that. I understand. I'm going to give some freedom. And then the next year, Will doesn't give enough guidance. And I'm, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, great. So, I've, you know, and so, you know, it's just something you pick up over time. I think, yeah. I think you need to have an element of, um, self awareness and alert, like, and alert and sort of just, you need to be, um, sort of humble and learn that it is a learning thing and and you know leadership is something that takes a, lo a long time to get good at and i'm yeah. <laughs> it means i think of myself as a fantastic leader it's something i'm always learning on yeah um, but i think it's you know what i would say is i think if um i think being able to communicate to others in a business is is massively important so for developers who have aspirations of um C you know ctos or whatever senior um senior business stuff it's 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 much more than you can be an amazing programmer but that doesn't mean you're going to be an amazing cto i think i think you need to be able to communicate and i think you need to be able to work with others yeah. and so i'd urge like those kind of things developers to focus on not just the tech stuff but the kind of the the, the people stuff as well and being yeah. able to communicate and work as part of a team because being an amazing programmer will get you a long way especially like you know today you know there's lots of opportunities yeah. but it's not gonna if you want to get into you know the higher like the higher echelons of business you need to i think be a good communicator absolutely yeah definitely and um another point you alluded to there was that your role has been i guess you've got more exposure or dragged towards the commercial side and some of the more important business decisions as well, which um, obviously for a business of uh, of your size and given the journey of which you've been on in terms of, I guess, receiving funding and looking to grow, how much of your time is spent on the business side now and, you know, taking the important financial decisions into consideration when, when, when looking to apply technology to the business problems? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we've got a fantastic executive team and a fantastic financial uh, director who knows a lot more about that stuff than me, and, and makes much, much helps make much those decisions easier. Yeah, um, I mean, but we, you know, as an executive team, we work as a team and we we decide as a team. So it's it's uh, you know it's it's definitely shared. Um, so we spend a lot of time on strategy, on the direction, and the kind of the how we can set up the business and the processes and the people to help make you know how, how sort of make that stuff happen um so i kind of i, I guess from like how time splits up i i think i probably spend you know maybe 20 to 30 percent doing tech stuff whether that's yeah. programming whether like it's like infrastructure or whatever it is and the rest of the time on either like team sort of team process team management or com like commercial stuff to yeah. other kind of other kind of like leadership -y things so it's yeah. i think that the tech stuff and, and again it will depend i mean this stuff changes on the depending on the business you're in and the stage you're in i mean the, like the earlier on you're spending more time on the tech stuff working that and then as that matures it's more kind of just in, you know other people are taking that on and you're kind of you know what you have the teams know what they're doing and what they're doing in they can just sort of they can just motor with it so it, it, yeah it's definitely peaks and troughs but yeah i mean we're we're all like as a leadership team all kind of um all kind of involved in that decision making yeah okay cool and um in terms of uh, building uh, an engineering team product teams what are the key considerations that that you've given or what are the most important characteristics that you look for now when, when hiring somebody for your small to medium-sized team would you say yeah so i mean definitely i'm into cross-functional teams so i think uh, yeah we we want we want that so we want people who can work together and collaborate that's massively important um we want to like for us it's want to strike the balance between experience and aptitude i think it's important to like be able to get people who have got um experience who have done different things and who can bring something to the team that you know the team hasn't had already yeah. and at the same time you know we've had a lot of luck investing in people with less experience and mm -hmm. looking for that aptitude and then developing them i mean as with all businesses, there are parts of us, our sort of tech stack and our business that are very esoteric and very kind of unique to us that yep. they're gonna, people are going to have to learn. Yep. And so if you've got the aptitude to learn, then you can come in with less experience and, that, and that'd be absolutely fine. So we, we like to get a mix of people there. Um, and then really like trying to actively encourage diversity. I mean, yep. you know, it's, uh, it's something that we're working on. We have a a separate team on a kind of a, a inclusivity and diversity perspective to try and encourage that more in the business um, because 
trust just hiring people like yourself yeah and you're going to end up with like a tribe mentality and it's not you know for us that's not what we want we want to encourage diversity get the people's different outlooks in yeah. that makes the team stronger so yeah trying to build a very diverse team so looking at all our hiring practices um looking at how we can do that is really important to us as well yeah amazing i think that's yeah something that um i can't remember the percentage now but it was it was, it was quite striking in terms of the increase in um innovation and sort of creativity around product development that you'd see throughout diverse teams and obviously that's because of the difference in opinions difference in um how people approach tasks and and, and so on so yeah something that we're hearing a lot of um and in terms of the um sort of culture what kind of culture have you created there and you know how is how is that sort of sustainable from the, the, the smaller team when you started to, to how it is now yeah i mean culture is an interesting one i mean it, <laughs> there's definitely some things that don't work so i mean for like sustainable so you know employee handbooks that you know like that thick that you get chuck in a drawer they're just you know full of cliches that that, that, that that's something that doesn't really work for, you know um you know that team that yearly team buildings with like culture gurus that kind of stuff doesn't typically work either um you know what in what we found that works with from a culture is you want to be able to have a very open and transparent culture i mean culture by its nature i think should evolve and change yeah. and i think you, we have we try and have a, we've got a strong vision and we do have values but at the same time appreciating that think, things change and those changes can and should come from anywhere in the business so where you know from our perspective from a leadership perspective the culture is very much that we want to be transparent and respectful and open and open to the culture changing so the culture shouldn't be a fixed thing i mean some of the you know not wanting to get political i guess but some of the worst things in you know society now are based on a view of culture being a static thing that was like a yesteryear thing i think you need to think of it as something that's evolving and developing and it should change so yeah. so and, and so for us a good culture is a culture that is open and transparent and can change and we've tried we've tried to do that and it is it's about that autonomy it's about giving people ownership of things it's about people being able to suggest changes and it's about leadership listening to that and then adapting to it yeah yeah couldn't agree more i think some of the best environments i've worked in have had that you know open uh transparency culture where everyone's voice is heard um and everyone's kind of included in decisions or right, not all decisions but important ones that are going to affect everyone on a day-to-day -day basis we, we want to make sure everyone's happy and happy equals productive and and, and the people that want to stay. So um, that's great to hear. Um, now, obviously, as a business that's um, heavily reliant on sort of domestic and international travel, um, it's fair to say 2020 uh, hasn't been the ideal year. I'm sure it hasn't been smooth sailing for the, for the business. Um, I guess there's a couple of points to, to, to cover off here. Um, I'm interested to, to understand kind of, you know, what, happened and what decisions needed to be made quickly in around March, April time, but also what, if uh, if anything at all, you've done as a business to pivot or change any of the marketing strategy or the, or the product at all to um, cope with uh, what has been a really uh, challenging time uh, for, for the travel sector in particular throughout, throughout 2020. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. It's been, it has been very challenging, and we are, a tra you know, we're a travel, we are a travel and pet business, so it's uh, yeah. massively impactful. So, um, yeah, so I mean, start, you know, come March and April um, when everything uh, kicked off and lockdown set in. Um, yeah, we we were extremely concerned. I mean, it's um, you know, people aren't traveling; they're not leaving their pets. Do they need a house sitter? Do you want a stranger? Who may or may not have COVID in your house? Like I think this probably wasn't wasn't great, and we were very concerned. Um, but the reality is, we've just you know we've been incredibly lucky. I think having a member base and a community that's just been so passionate about what we do. When people use us, they just just see how brilliant a solution it is. And the people, these people, you know, our, our members, they meet and they're they're solving each other's problems, but they're also generating friendships and yeah. they're making connections and stuff. So they're kind of really. Um, you know really 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 like us and uh the fact that we're a subscription business you know people pay for 12 months we were finding um although as the travel bans kicked in and people weren't able to travel we did see a you know significant drop in our acquisition our new customers um but our existing members continued to renew and continue to support the business and that was really like a massive lifeline for us you know during the during the crisis so um 
yeah so that that kept us going and then again due to the sort of the global nature of the business as lockdowns lifted in various places we started to see activity and so it's definitely been up and down i mean it's not you know you can't lie there's definitely been places where it's gone better and, and it's getting and they, that starts opening up and we get all enthusiastic yeah. and then it gets locked down again and goes down again so it's definitely been yeah. sort of an up and down up and down journey um but again now we're starting to see some green shoots and that's sort of starting to lift um with regards to pivots we we looked at we sort of looked at how we could help some of our stranded members in the early days of the crisis how we could sort of um connect them sort of sitters with owners some of our sitter members don't own houses they're almost yeah. nomadic and they go from sit to sit and of course right. when this struck they had nowhere to go so we looked at how we could try and connect them with places like people's second homes or whatever to try and give them a place mm -hmm. to sort of weather the storm um yeah. and, then, and then we've really just use the opportunity to try and you know batten down the hatches look where we could save cost look how we could be smart with some stuff ready so when the kind of traffic and starts traveling again we can emerge even stronger yeah absolutely fantastic so it's really that um so i guess the the position within the market sorry i've got a dog here jumping on <laughs> so on brand yeah exactly here we go <laughs> um, <laughs> fantastic good timing katie um, so I guess in terms of the brand position in the market, but also that real sense of community that you've built has been kind of pivotal, really, and, and instrumental in, in seeing you through. And I guess that's something which you want to pay even more attention to going forward and seeing how you can leverage that to become. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I and, mean, you know, and recently, you know, we launched a forum. So, again, really like the learnings of that community, like seeing the strength of the community and how, you know, how people are so into this and, and thinking what can we could do there so yeah we've we've launched a community forum which is getting you know really great engagement and that's yeah. growing because what we want to do is just sh like share this like there's a bunch of you know we've got seventy thousand members who are loving it we want we want to share that with more we want yeah. seven hundred thousand members yeah. right so i think it's just trying to get the word out yeah absolutely um any particular sort of markets that you see as key growth areas for you next year at all or is it just a case of waiting to see what happens in the world and yeah, and yeah. I mean, wait and see what happens i think we'll, we'll you know wherever the people start moving around again yeah. um then we'll be there so um you know we've really keen on the us i mean the us is a big market for us it's not you know we have a like we have sits going california is big for us yeah. um you know florida the east coast but there's such opportunity there um so really for us yeah, you know pushing into the us and really kind of and build that's where we want to be focusing so and and from a um sort of growth perspective i guess we can definitely put a line through through 2020 but give ourselves a pat on the back for getting where we are today and, you know having giving yourselves the opportunity as, as a lot of businesses have ourselves included to to go into 2021 with a fighting chance but given the good sentiment around vaccines and travel restrictions being lifted you're quite positive about that Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, we've we've been the way we've managed to tread water and stay where we are and still, you know, be a going concern because of the support of the members. It just shows our kind of you know product market fit. It shows that we have a place and we've got a great solution. And so, yeah, we're really buoyant and bullish about next year. And we feel that there's going to be all these people with, you know, some of the. I don't know about you, but so many people I know have bought pets during yeah. the lockdown periods. Yeah. And they've not been able to go away and come around to next year. I'm sure they're going to be chomping at the bit to yeah. um, to go away and see the world. And they've got they've got these lovely animals that they want to they want to be taken care of. So yeah, yeah we're we're extremely bullish on the opportunity for next year. Hundred percent. Yeah. Well, we've already. I think we've got. You've seen one. We've had two new dog additions to the to the to the office team over the last week <laughs> already, and that is going to be a problem that needs solving. So I know where I'll be uh, I'll be suggesting for them. Um, Absolutely. And from a um, sort of, I guess, a technology perspective or a, a product perspective, are there any sort of key initiatives that you could share or any sort of areas of, of product development that you guys are going into that's going to, I guess, change the product offering at all or anything that's sort of interesting for us to hear about in that front? Um, I mean, so we're you know we we're sort of using react and we've got a we've got a react native app so we've we launched the app um a couple of years ago um and that's gets great engagement people who use that are more successful than people who use the desktop so we're sort of um going to be next year probably spending some more focus on that yeah um 
focusing a lot on uh, you know verifications yeah. and reviews and really trying to help anything that helps build you know trust in the community so looking at how we can Im improve that um, trying to give members um, you know just more more functionality more things to yeah. to help drive success really yeah. um, things like you know machine learning recommendation engines things to just help their success um, all that kind of stuff so yeah, really, really kind of focus on those kind of things. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Sounds interesting and exciting. Um, and from your perspective, if you were to, I guess, give the will of seven years ago, 10 years ago, a bit of advice, um, <laughs> there's, it's going to be broadcast to our Silicon Bright community where there's lots of engineers who will, um, you know, listen to this and, and think that'd be a, it's a great journey that I, I'd love to embark upon myself. What tips would you give somebody in your position 10 years ago or what anyone that's an aspiring CTO, if you like, um, any words of wisdom that you could share with them? Words of wisdom. Well, I, I think, so what I would say, one, I think if you want to just program, be a programmer or an engineer, don't, I don't think being a CTO is where it's at. I honestly believe that, like, I think, and I, and I think that's absolutely fine. I think you can, you can, you can be an amazing engineer and just do that. I think one of the downsides in our industry is that people feel pressured to move into management yeah. um, or move into people. And I just quite honestly think it's not for everybody. And I think, I think so. I would definitely say if you really enjoy programming, you should just crack on with that and make a great career from being a fantastic programmer and a fantastic yeah. engineer. And there'll be, and that's a fantastic choice. Yeah. Um, being a CTO definitely feels like there's much more of the, like I said before, there's a people element to it and um, a commercial element to it. That And it moves, I think as businesses grow, you move further away from some of the tech stuff. Um, that's just, that's just the way. So that's definitely some advice, I think. Yeah. Um, I think definitely join meetups and learn from others. I mean, we've got in Brighton a fantastic CTO uh, meetup group. Um, lots of, you know, great, great people down there. Learn from learning from others because it's just, you know, everyone's sort of been through this everyone's faced similar challenges and yeah. you, know, you don't need to do this on your own sometimes and i think i mean mark you know marketeers and finance directors and they they obviously have the need some niche skills but with technology you're almost speaking a different language sometimes and it can be quite a lonely place yeah. on the sort of an exec table when you're trying to explain why you want to be doing something and everyone's just going this doesn't make why would you want to do this that we don't care about that api it doesn't make any sense to us um so having other people you can reach out to in your network to discuss and and be like am i making a massive mistake is this entirely sensible you know you, you need people to talk to so i would encourage everyone to just you know to network yeah. uh, which again i think some techies it's not their strength i mean, net, I mean networking is not my definitely not my forte but it's been incredibly useful so I, I think definitely trying to do that earlier in your career helps yeah great great news yeah so um you know doing what you enjoy playing to your own strengths and you know recording calling on the resources that are close to you i think you, know, you rightly point out the local um community or sort of i guess networking meetup scene is, is really engaging it is you know everyone really would like to help each other and there's lots of cool resources some we're supporting and, and others we're not involved in but all um equally engaged to try and i guess help each other in brighton to be a thriving tech scene which is it already is but there's definitely um you know high on the agenda is is, is getting those meetup groups buzzing again next year hopefully we'll be able to get in front of one another um and 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 start sharing some of those experiences and, and knowledge and i think you know, all being well it should be an exciting place to be next year absolutely yeah absolutely looking forward to it great stuff well thanks very much for joining me it's been a pleasure to hear about uh, yourself and a bit about the trusted house it's a story um i think it's very much a case of watch this space uh things are, uh, are very much looking on the up and um yeah excited to see and hear what's to come from you guys in, in 2021. Um, I'll certainly be um, shouting about you guys and sharing the platform with people in my network, my friends and family. Um, and yeah, if you're watching this and you know one of the problems that was mentioned is, is a problem that you face, then um, hopefully you'll go to, over to the website and, um, and, uh, and find a solution. But yeah, thanks very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you at one of those meetups in person next year, mate. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Matt. Great. Cheers.